All right, after that, uh, today is Monday, April 4th. We're going to go over Chapter 7 today. All right, and remember, we're going to go through the first nine chapters of the book this semester. So you're going to have an assignment for Chapter 7. You may or may not, we'll see where we are with time, have one for Chapter 8. There will not be one for Chapter 9. And by the end of the semester, probably during the last week of the semester, what I'm going to do is we're going to build a calculator. We're going to build it twice. We're going to build it first using just code. Then we're going to come back and redo it, and we're going to build a GUI. All right, so that we'll be able to start doing GUI stuff, and we'll be able to continue doing GUI stuff next semester. All right, so again, I'm not sure what page this is. I don't really care, but uh, okay. Supposedly, thank you. You, you, you were covering arrays in your last class, those of you who are in the class. Now, if you notice here, the author says an array can hold multiple values of the same type simultaneously. That's an old definition. I mean, if you look what I've got up here, I've got an array as a set of contiguous memory locations that each hold the same type of value. But you notice there's two asterisks in there, all right? Because, you know, probably most of the people in here know what happens with disk fragmentation. So in other words, if you keep saving stuff to, a, to a, a disk, especially back in the days of floppy disks, you know, when you kept saving stuff and saving stuff and saving stuff, eventually you got it where there were a bunch of pockets of information that were free where you could save stuff and a lot of other stuff was, was kind of just held with other things and whatever. So you'd have to fragment your disk. Well, in the same way, what the system tries to do is it tries to make sure when you set up an array, it tries to make sure that those memory locations are contiguous. But what if you ask for an array of a million its? You know, it may or may not have that much contiguous memory available to it. So it'll do the best it can to try to come up with it, but there's no guarantee that they will be contiguous. The other thing is, now with Java, this is true. In Java, each array element has to be of the same type. But I believe everybody who's in this class last semester was in the JavaScript class. And in JavaScript, the elements don't have to be of the same data type. And all right, next semester you'll go through PHP. Those elements don't have to be of the same data type. But next semester you'll also go through C. Those elements do have to be the same data type. All right? So it just, it, as always, it depends. The good news about making them all be the same data type is typically it's cleaner. And typically the program will operate faster because it knows in advance, oh, you said this was an int. So everything in here has to be an int. All right? As opposed to something like with, with um, PHP or JavaScript where there's got to be a lot more reconciliation done. All right? The other thing, and I've used these terms for you to, or with you before, is that Java is one of those languages that's referred to be as being early binded. So in other words, size, type, must be known at compile time. All right? So you've got to know the size of your array and the types of values that it's going to hold at compile time. And it can't change. You can't make an array bigger in Java as the program's running. Well, how do you get around that? Well, that's at the end of the chapter. Not only does Java have something called an array, they also have something that's called an array list. And an array list can increase and decrease or grow and shrink, all right, as the program's running. But when you've got something that's late binded, all right, so that's when the size is decided oops, at runtime. So it's compile time versus runtime. All right? So keep that in mind as we start on the array journey here. Now you'll notice here, and the author, again, as he oftentimes does, shows you and he says int bracket bracket numbers and then later numbers equal new int 6. All right, but typically you're not going to do it like that. You're typically going to do it more like this, where you both create the array and you give it, a, you know, an amount. So why would you want to do this? You know, the way he shows it here, but then in the book the author does this, int 
bracket bracket grades and then later on so there there could be some code in here we don't know but there could be some code in here then he says grades equals new int 10. well the answer and i'll answer the question is sometimes in here this won't be a number this will be a variable and i might ask things like how many students are in the class i might ask that in here all right and depending on my different classes i mean my smallest class i think has got 12 and my largest class has got about 19. all right so this does not have to be a number in fact he even mentions that a lot of times what you'll see in here is something like final int size equal 10 for example all right then this will end up being size and you can change it later if you need to but all i'm trying to get across to you is what goes in here that can be a number that can be a variable that can be a constant that's totally up to you as far as how you set this up all right not only that if you look at this and it may not seem like a real big thing to you but i just want to mention this these two things are exactly the same okay except in the one case you put the brackets before the variable name and in the other case you put the brackets after the variable name well long story short this is typically the way it's done in java oops and this is typically the way that it's done in c but java will allow you to do this either way and it did it because it's, it took a lot of the stuff that it has from the c language all right so did C-sharp for that matter. All right, so he talks about all this stuff. And the key thing is when you do something like this, you've got an array. And the way that you refer to the elements of the array, typically the way you would read these it would, it would be numbers sub-zero, numbers sub-one, numbers sub-two, numbers sub-three, numbers sub-four, and numbers sub-five. In other words, the first element... I use sub because sub is short for subscript. Sometimes you'll, instead it'll be read, again, read numbers element zero, numbers element one, or whatever. But the ideas are the same. All right. But it's zero-based, meaning that all array elements, the first element is always zero. So you can use the length with an array to figure out how many elements are in the array. But if I use the, the length property here, it would tell me there's six elements, even though there are elements zero through five there are still six of them you can create an array of any type and they show you some examples right here again as i mentioned to you before you can set this up or you can you know they've set it up there as a constant or you can set it up as a variable depending on what you need all right so again as far as accessing them as i mentioned sometimes they're called subscripts sometimes they're called elements it doesn't matter it just shows the fact that people in IT can't agree on anything, all right? And, it, again, you read one book, and it'll say element throughout. You read another book, it'll use subscript throughout. And you, you read another book, it might even call it something else. But hopefully at least you get the idea. As they mention again, always starts at zero, all right? And as he says in the book here, the expression there is typically pronounced numbers sub-zero. That's usually the way that you hear it pronounced. All right. So what they're showing you here is they're, they're putting in a bunch of values. And then they're showing you what it will look like afterward. All right. Notice, by default, Java initializes array elements with zero. So if you don't initialize them yourself, they automatically get set to zero. That's, that's a poor programming practice. You should never count on the language to do something like that for you. You should always do it yourself. All right. So they start to go through some, and this, again, the, the one nice thing about arrays, and you'll see this before the end of the period today, is they're meant to work hand-in-hand -in -hand with loops. And really, when you think about it, since when you create an array and you start to use it, you need to know how many elements are in it, all right, so you've already got a count. For loops and arrays work hand in hand. And it's not that you can't use, instead of a for loop, you can't use a while or a do while. Of course you can. 
All right, but again, remember, typically using a for loop results in a little bit less code. So most programmers use for loops with arrays. All right, and in this example here, you, you see, you, you really wouldn't want to do it like this. Employee one, employee two, employee three. You use arrays, so you only have to write that kind of stuff once. All right, and it may not be that bad because you only have three employees. What if that was 100 employees? Would you really want to put that in here, all this stuff, 100 times? I sure as heck wouldn't. All right. It works fine the way they're showing it, but typically, again, you'd use that and you'd use it um, along with, with some kind of a loop, probably a for loop. And then they show the same example. The only thing that you may find confusing if you take a look at this code is right here. And just two things about that. First of all, you are doing a calculation in there, and you're doing it in the middle of a system.out.print line, so it has to be within the parens. And second, all that's going to do is instead of it saying um, employee 0, employee 1, and employee 2, it will now say employee 1, employee 2, and employee 3. If you just use the index, it would be 0, 1, 2 but we're adding one to it every time. Why? Because to most people, that makes more sense. It still is being held as 0, 1, and 2, but you're just showing it aesthetically as 1, 2, 3. All right, he does a good job in here. What is this? Page 411, it looks like, of just explaining exactly what's going on in there. All right? All right, not only does Java perform bounds checking, but if, you know, this may be the first time, if you haven't gotten one of these before, you may end up getting something when you run your program that looks like this. Something that looks like that. And what that means is, for example, if I create an array and I say that that array has 10 elements in it, 0 through 9, and if for some reason I try to access element 20, which doesn't exist, I'll get that. All right. And again, this is the subject. I think it's like chapter 11 or something like that. You know, it's something you, you worry about for next semester. All right. But that's an exception. When Java doesn't understand something and you break the rules, it throws an exception, much like C Sharp, much like a lot of programming languages do. So as it says, it performs range or balance checking. The big thing is when you do that, you've got to make sure you don't get what you have here. That's referred to as an off by one error. Play computer. All right. It says for index equals zero, index less than four. So that in that case, it will do zero, one, two, and three. All right. Well, notice it'll do zero, one, two, and three. And it'll end up giving you an array index out of bounds error. It's the same kind of thing I mentioned before. What we're going to see in just a minute, you don't have to worry about this. Because there's a length method that you can use with it. And you'll probably end up using that virtually all the time. So again, another example. What's the big problem that the person had here? They tried to start with one. And they said, go up to 100. Well, remember, since it's an array, it starts with 0, and it goes to 99. All right? Already showed you this, and I guess I was wrong. I couldn't remember what it was, and I was too lazy to go back and look at it. But with this, you don't say new inch. You just do it like that. You can do it over one, all in one line. You can do it over multiple lines. It doesn't matter. But what this is doing is it's not only setting up an array, but it's also initializing it. If you use that method to create an array, where not only do you set the array up, but you also initializes, initialize it, rather, do not put a number in there. Even though technically you could put in 10, you may get an error from the system because the compiler wants to figure out the size for you. And that only is the case if you're initializing it. And when you initialize it, it must be within curly braces. All right. 
One nice thing about this language is it uses brackets here for everything. Some languages use, you know, and it's just goofy the way they do it, they use brackets sometimes and parens other times. That's what JavaScript does. All right, it would be nice if it was more consistent, but that's just the way that it is. And also, like in JavaScript, you could do something like say, you can say, for example, var numbers equal array. You can do that in JavaScript, and that creates an empty array. You can do something similar to that in PHP. You can't do that in Java. When you're working with Java, you either have to give it a size yourself, or you have to give it a size where the compiler can figure out what the size is. You can't just leave it blank like this. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Technically, that's a zero-based array. That's an array with nothing in it. You can't have that in this language. And again, another example here where these are the months, the six or 12 months out of the year, but notice, yes, it does go from zero to less than 12, but they use the index plus one here, because otherwise with most people, it's very confusing to say month zero has 31 days. You know, even if I was doing a program with students, I probably would do an index plus one because I'd want to say student one, student two, student three, et cetera, as opposed to starting with student zero. What I already mentioned, you can do it either way here. The old joke always is, if you do it this way, you're a Java programmer. And if you do it this way, oh, you're a C programmer who's doing Java now, huh? You know, and it's, but it, it will take it either way. You'll almost exclusively see it in Java programs like that, almost always. All right. When you work with the individual pieces of an array, each element in an array, all right, it, you handle it just like any other kind of variable. So again, you know, we, we've talked about this kind of thing before, but the reason that you might want to do something, let's just leave that one up here. The reason you might want to do something like that is that's much easier than saying int grade one equals, and let's just say we were going to initialize them all to zero, int grade two equals zero, et cetera. You could do that. It's just a lot of work. All right, and imagine that instead of, at, at a technical college, you were working at a university. I remember taking a, uh, an economics class at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. There were 500 people in my class, all right? And that sure as heck wouldn't work. If you start doing it like this, the chances are you're going to repeat something or you're going to miss something. Or you're just somehow going to screw it up, all right? But here, if, I want, if there's 500, that's all I've got to do. And if I'm doing it inside of a loop, all right, if I'm inputting those grades, it's still going to take a while to input those. Again, that's why we'd probably use something like a file with 500 grades in it. All right, so they, what they show in here is, again, just the fact that when you do this and you're working with an individual array element, it's just like any other kind of piece of, of primitive data that we've looked at before. Again, you'll notice here they've come in and they create a constant that they're using here. All right, so we talked a little bit about the length. That's how you use it. So in the example that we looked at before, you know, in here, and if I said int len equal grades dot length, and we had it back to what we put in here originally, that would return 10, all right? And again, we've, we've looked at this before, but I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to say for LCV equals zero, LCV less than uh, grades dot length, LCV, plus plus. That is totally syntactically, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you do it like this, 
It has to go and calculate that every time. And it may not take a long time, but what if you've got thousands of students? You know, it, it's, it's an unnecessary calculation because if you've already done this up here, that's, that's for lack of better words, it's, it's treated as though it's a constant. So if I come through here and say, Len, all right, now it doesn't have to do the calculation every time. All right, that's one of the things that you should start thinking about doing. That's just a little bit of a way to optimize your code. And it sounds funny to say optimize it because you're adding code to it. But sometimes you do have to add code to make the program run faster. Notice that length is a constant. It can never appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign. Okay? All right. Most programming languages, and Java is an example, allow you, allow you to use what's called an enhanced for loop. Some languages call it a for in loop. Some call it a for each loop. Java's is a little different. They just call it literally an enhanced for loop. All right? So when you look at this, Here's an example of how it's used. So you might say, that doesn't buy me a lot. It's a little less typing. All right? And what you're doing right here is numbers is the name of the array, and int val is just something that you're creating on the fly. All right? Now, if you decide you're going to use this enhanced for loop like this, first of all, I would typically, myself, I would put that in the curly braces, even though the author didn't. All right. The other thing is it's assumed that if you use this enhanced for loop, that inside of the loop, you're not changing anything that's in the array. It's just done for display purposes. All right. So why would you use it? Because it's faster. So if all you want to do, let's say that I've calculated 10 letter grades, and I want to print them out, and I'm never going to change them once I've calculated them, this would be faster then. All right, and it's the same stuff I mentioned before. You, you cannot use that enhanced for loop if you're going to change the contents of any array element. And it's also meant to go in just an ascending order. You can't do it if you're in descending order. It also assumes that you're playing with every element in the array, not a subset. It also assumes that you're working with usually just a single array. So they, they give you some of the rules here. All right. Letting the user specify the size, this is the same thing I mentioned to you before. You ask the user, how many tests did you have? And then that goes into num tests, and then you make an array based off of the size of the variable. So bottom line, it's what I mentioned before. When you're figuring out the size of an array, you can either hard code it in, all right, just literally put a number in there, or you can put a constant in there, or you can put a variable in there. Any of them will work. Once you've started to create an array, all right, it says reassign numbers to a new array. New int 5 equal numbers. I'm trying to figure out what he's trying to do here. It is possible to reassign an array reference variable to a different array as explained by the following code. Int numbers equal new array. Okay. Numbers equal new int 5. I have no idea what he's trying to do there. It says the first statement creates a 10-element integer array and assigns its address to numbers. Okay, so that right there would do this right here. It says the second element allocates a five-element integer array and assigns its address to the numbers variable. All right, it says after this, the numbers variable references the five-element array instead of the ten-element array. I don't know why you would ever want to do anything like that. Maybe he's just trying to show you that you can. I don't know. Copying arrays, a real big, really kind of an important thing here. If I go back, and we looked at this before, so if I've got this array that we had looked at earlier that looked like this, so if I say int grades equal, and I put in here, let's just make up So I just threw, a, threw 10 values in there quickly. 
and so that it doesn't get off the screen. I'm not even putting any spaces in there. All right. So if I do this, I cannot do this. I can't say int bracket bracket grades two equal grades. You can't do that. All right. Not in one swoop. But I can say int grades two equal new int and then put in 10 just like we had in here before. Then I can say for int LCV equals zero, LCV less than, again, I would want to come up here and say len equal grades dot length. And please take a look at that. And if it doesn't make sense, ask that literally. So if I created two arrays, I wouldn't even show 10. I'll just show five values in here. And I'll show five values in here. So if this is grades, and let's just say this has got 100, 90, 80, 70, and 60. All we're doing in those lines is we're saying copy this one to here. This one to here, this one to here, this one to here, and this one to here. All we're doing. But you must do that with an array in this language. There are other languages that allow you to do a direct copy like that. This isn't one of them. He shows it in the program, so if you'd rather look at his stuff, that's in the book on 423, it looks like. All right. You can pass an array to a method. When you pass an array to a method, okay, you just pass the name of the array. Did everybody hear that? You just pass the name of the array. So if you look in here, all right, if I want to pass... Well, he doesn't give you a great example. He, here he's just passing in an individual element of the array. All right? But if you pass an entire array in, you just give it the name. But in the actual method itself, you've got to use the brackets. And don't put a number in there. So what this says is show array gets passed into it an array of integers that in here we're going to refer to as array. The question, the good question, we haven't gotten there yet, but the question was when you pass that in, if you pass an entire array into a method, it gets passed by reference. You're passing everything and any change you make is permanent. If you pass in an individual array element, it's passed by value. Now, they've got in here, the author calls it some useful array algorithms and operations comparing arrays. I'm going to show you some of this stuff after the break. I'm going to literally write a program. And, I, and you know, some of you, in, in your zeal to get this stuff, write everything down. And that's up to you, all right? But I think it'd be more important that you just watch me do a few things because I'm going to give you a different program to work on in class on, thir on Wednesday, rather, like we've been doing, okay? And it'll give you a chance to work with a lot of this stuff. But I think it's important that you watch what I'm doing, and hopefully then it'll make some sense to you, all right? So when you compare arrays, okay, if you compare an array, it says the following code appears to compare two arrays, but it does not. It, that won't work. You've got to put that inside of a loop, and you've got to compare it element by element. All right, That's the only way it works in this language. Again, there are some languages that allow you to say, if this equals this. Java is not one of them. Question. Yes. Um, 
in your if statement, if you say, um, if you compare, if, can you compare individual um, elements inside the array to each other? Yes, sure. So, in fact, we're going to look at that before the end of the period because okay. you actually do that when you're doing sorting. All right, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do sorts, but unlike JavaScript that has a built-in sort method, Java does not. All right, so you can write your own. It's not very hard, but the difference is depending on how you do it, depending on the algorithm that you use in, in order to do that, um, there can be a big speed difference, especially as the array gets bigger. But if you look at the example that we have on the board here, where I've got five elements, 190, 80, 70, and 60, what this does is it goes through and it compares these two elements. And it says, oh, you know, again, with a simple uh, a swapping type of thing, say, oh, that's, that's big, you know, that's, uh, I'd have to swap those two. Then it would compare these two, then these two, et cetera. What you'd get when you got done is that value, that 100, would be at the end when you got done. So the next time you went through it, you only have to compare four of them. All right, you can do that in either direction. So that, that's typically, that's a bubble sort where either the, the largest value bubbles down to the bottom or the smallest value bubbles up to the top. And we're going to look at that before the end of the period today. Now, nice, nice as far as summing the values in a numeric array, that's all you got to do. There is an accumulator total, and it says, okay, start with element zero, and as long as I have elements, add them to total. Again, I wish that he would have done a couple things in here. I wish he wouldn't have units.length. I wish he would have done it the way I showed you, where he would have set up in between these two lines. You know, so in other words, I think he sh it would have been much cleaner, even though it's a little bit more code. Yeah, right. Even though it's a little bit more, hmm, it's a little bit more code to have written it like this. So instead of like that, all right, int total is fine. Then we would have said here, int length equals, uh, what is it, units dot length. And then here, this would have just said, and in fact, typically it's called len, because in some languages, length may be a keyword. So, And then put that into, whoops, curlies. So in the second case, when I did it, it's more code, all right, but it's much easier to read, and it will execute faster, mainly because of that line that's right there. Now, if, if there's 10 things in the array, what's faster? It might be a millionth of a second faster. But again, if you are writing an, an application that is working with millions of different things in there, you might be surprised. I, I've been given assignments before at jobs where they said, optimize this code. And what you do is you take the code and you hook it up to the system clock and you find what's taking the most time. Then you start going through there and say, okay, it's this right here. How do I rewrite that so it goes faster? That's code optimization. All right, to get the average, what do you have to do? Well, you add them, just like we did before with the sum. Same exact thing. Then and you only do this outside of a loop, you say average equals that total, which you just figured out, divided by how many elements there are. And remember, if you do that, let's say that they're an array of grades. And let's say these are, in this case, they did a good job because they made them both double. But sometimes you'll have like, for example, int total here. Then you have to remember to cast, otherwise you could be off. The highest and the lowest, there's different ways of doing this. This is what they're showing here is one of the ways. So what we do in here, and, it just, and the way it turns out, this is the highest one. But what they're doing in the example that you see on the screen right now is they say, assume that the first one is the biggest. All right. Then compare each of them to it. If you find one that's bigger, it's the new biggest. Otherwise, that's the biggest. And in a second, he'll show this the lowest. The, the, for the largest and the smallest, they're the exact same thing. Except instead of saying highest, you say lowest. 
And instead of saying greater than, you say less than. It's the same algorithm. All right, so again, we're going to look at this after the break. So he goes through an example when he runs through talking about sum and average and the highest and the lowest, etc. So take a look at that because you, one of the assignments that you're going to have, you're going to have to work with that. All right, and you can see what he has here. He's got what? Seven days. 1,500, 3,000, 4,000, 9,000, 6,000, 7,000. Play computer. The smallest one is going to end up being the 500. The largest one is going to end up being the 9,000. If you add those seven together and divide by seven, that's going to give you the average. If you add all seven of these together, that's going to give you the sum. And that's exactly what he's doing in here. Yeah, if you want some more, Roger, creating an object that processes an array. He goes through in one of his examples here. And this actually, that is, it is a pretty good example. Okay. But he goes through different routines to do everything that's in there. All right. Partially filled arrays. It says sometimes you need to store a series of items in an array, but you don't know the number of items that there are. So you can create what's called a partially filled array. And if you don't get what that means, think about it this way. Let's assume I never want to change the, the number once I set it up for the size of an array. And again, let's suppose for a second that I, I teach at a university where I have three kinds of classes. I've got a lecture hall where there can be up to 500 people. All right. I've got a, a large discussion where there can be up to 50 people. And I've got a small discussion where there can only be up to 10 people. Well, if I want one array that will handle everything, I've got to make it 500. Because that will handle any size then. The problem is if it's a small discussion, I'm wasting 490 storage, or, yeah, 490 storage locations. In the other case, 450. So sometimes you don't know in advance. All right. So that's what they're talking about in here. Arrays and files. Nothing new in there. You've worked with files before. I've hit you guys a little harder with files than I have with uh, the people that have taken the, the courses from me in the past. But I think you're better at it than they are. All right. And I think that when we go over file handling in PHP, it should be fairly simple to you because files are virtually handled the same way in almost any programming language. They all have their own little nuances, but basically they're handled the same. When you return an array from a method, notice the return type, double bracket bracket. All right, and it's just what you think it would be. It means that we are returning an array of doubles. So you better make sure that whatever comes after the, or after the return statement is an array and is of type double. And again, you can make an array of anything. You can have an array of Booleans, you can have an array of ints, you can have an array of doubles, an array of floats, etc. You know, then the question is, can you have an array of arrays? The answer is yes. So if you had an array of arrays, that would be a two-dimensional array. It would look more or less like a spreadsheet. You're not the only thing that limits you as far as the number of dimensions you can have in an array, I mean, if I tried to create an array that was a million by a million, I'm not going to have enough memory probably on the machine to do that. All right. You can have arrays of strings. So notice string bracket bracket names, and here they're initializing them. If you didn't know them, you'd have to put it in a loop, and you'd have to ask, you know, what is the name of the first student? What is the name of the second student? Et cetera. All right. And they do mention this, that since an array, I'm sorry, since a string is an object, literally what name sub zero holds is not bill, but it's the address in memory of where bill is. And it's not, again, it's not that you have to worry about that. That's all handled for you behind the scenes, all right? I, I will tell you, prob I, can, I can say this with pretty much, with, with a lot of assuredness. Next semester, when, when we're getting into, into C and we talk about pointers, you're going to hate them. 
It's about the hardest thing you can do with just about any programming language. All right? And because you're just working with addresses. When, when um, Apple first started working with programming and programming iPhones, you used Objective-C. That's even worse than C. Everything you do in that language is a pointer. So you use asterisks all over the place. Your code is really, really hard to read and really ugly. So two years ago, they decided, well, we're going to use Swift, which is more Java-like. All right, because they said, Let's, we'll, we'll still use pointers, but we'll use them behind the scenes. That's what Java does. It still uses pointers, but it's basically it's encapsulated or it's hidden from you, so you don't have to worry about it. Calling string methods from an array element. There's no reason you can't. Char at, to uppercase, etc. And you can have arrays of objects. So in other words, you know, we looked at this a little bit. In your last programming assignment, you were supposed to create that bank account class. All right? Think about it. If you were working as a programmer for a bank, you could have an array of bank accounts. Now, you probably wouldn't use an array. You'd probably use an array list in that case because, again, it can dynamically grow and shrink, and we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. But you can have an array of any kind, any primitive type or any object that either you create or a built-in Java object. All right? And we're going to take a break, but before we do again, this is a sequential search algorithm. There's different ways that you can do algorithms. The sequential search is the worst that you can, you can possibly use. All right? Think about this. If somebody was going to look up my number, I live in Rockton, Illinois, and they had a Rockton phone book. Even phone book sounds archaic today. But if you had a phone book, somebody says, well, I'm just going to turn to the S's, go look at SC. No, it's a phone book of everybody who lives in Rockton, but the bad news is it's not in alphabetic order. So you'd have to start at the beginning and just keep looking your way through there. In the best case, it's the first name. In the worst case, it ain't in there. So you look all the way through it. So with a problem with a sequential search algorithm is normally you have to look through half as many, on average, half as many elements as you have in the array. So if you've got an array with 5 billion elements, you'll typically, on average, have to search 2.5 billion for each one. That doesn't take the computer very long, all right? But if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it'll slow down your program. And that's what they talk about in here. And the key thing is, what you find out is if it's not in there, this is pretty much universal. You just return negative 1 meaning it's not there. Otherwise, you're, you might want to show the location and memory where it was. All right, negative one just means it isn't there. And that's what they show in here. Again, we'll look at this in a little bit more. All right, again, you can have arrays of arrays. That look familiar to you? Looks kind of like a spreadsheet to me. But instead of over here, one, two, three, etc., cetera, A, B, C, it's columns starting with zero, and it's rows starting with zero. So that's row zero, column zero, that's row two, column three, et cetera. All right, so they're done in what's called row major order. You can always tell how many elements are in there because you just multiply one subscript by the other one. So there's going to be 12 elements in there, three times four. All right. And when you, when you go and set them up, I mean, they're showing you this two-dimensional two array. There are a lot of people who just do what they can to not use multiple dimensions. They, it's, it's hard. It's too much work. It's like subqueries in MySQL. You know, it's like, why did God even invent those? All right? And they're not that hard if you use them all the time. But you'll notice that if you've got a two-dimensional array, you need two different for loops. A loop within a loop. So a three-dimensional array would have three of them. All right? And the author shows in here a three-dimensional array. And they show us, well, this is back still with a 2. That's one way of initializing it. You need curlies within curlies, but you can do it that way, this way, really whatever way you want. All right? And he gives you a bunch of stuff. We're not going to be doing really anything in here with two-dimensional arrays. But eventually, you know, he shows you how to add them. The ideas are the same, but you're using a loop within a loop, all right, 
where you only need one loop when you're working with a one-dimensional array. You can sum up the rows, you can sum up the columns, you can do whatever you want or need to do. All right, and I'll leave you with this, for, then we'll take a break. This is a ragged array. What does that mean? Well, notice over here for the number of columns, they purposely left it blank. All right, that says that you can have each row can have a different number, potentially, of columns in it. All right, why would you want to do that? Well, for instance, what if I've got a bunch of different students, and let's say that I've got an honors class mixed in with a non-honors class, and maybe the people in the honors class only have to take three tests, maybe other people have to take four tests, some other ones have to take five tests, and some other ones have to take six tests but I want to put them collectively together as a unit. This is a way that you can do that, all right? Some languages allow this ra these ragged arrays, some do not. And again, you can have as many dimensions as you can. I may have told you this, it sounds like bad humor. It was meant to be a joke, all right? But I guess you never do stuff like that when people don't know you very well. Because what I, what I did was we went over this once in a class, something like this, and I said, now you can have an array even of four or five dimensions. So I told people this was on a, like a, a Thursday. I said, go home and for Tuesday of next week, draw a four-dimensional array. People actually were trying to do it. All right. I had one guy come in and he was almost in tears. I worked on it for hours. I said, I worked on what? He told me, I'm like, oh, geez. And I said, how many people worked on that? Almost every hand went up. All right. So let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the selection sort and the binary search algorithms. We're almost done with the chapter. And then we'll look at an example. So it's 10.55. Let's come back, please, at 11.10.